In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mother of priests, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I dedicate the first conference to the theme of priestly identity, and in particular, its reflection in the charism of priestly celibacy. It hardly seems better to understand the sublime gift of the holy priesthood than to meditate upon the grace of the priestly order in the life of of an heroic priest. The importance of the reflection upon the gift the grace of the priesthood for priests so that they may respond ever more generously to the action of the same grace and for all the faithful for whom the priest acts in the person of Christ, head and shepherd of the flock in every time and place, is seen in a preeminent way in the lives of the great priest saints. Of course, it's never solely a matter of knowing better the saint, but also of loving the saint and seeking his help and intercession. And I'm sure for all of you, as for me, there are priest saints to whom we have a very special, for whom we have a very special affection, with whom we have a very particular rapport. And I would encourage you very much during these days of retreat to renew that relationship with the priest saints who have been most inspirational and helpful to you. In his letter proclaiming the year for priests, Pope Benedict XVI invited us to use his word to be enthralled by St. John Mary Vianney. In his homily for the opening of the year for priests, the Holy Father makes clear what uh, becoming enthralled with the curia of ours means. He said, to let oneself be totally won over by Christ. This was the purpose of the whole life of St. Paul, to whom we have devoted our attention during the Pauline year, which is now drawing to a close. You may remember the, the, the year of priests was preceded by a year of St. Paul. So the Holy Father makes reference. He says, this was the goal of the entire ministry of the Holy Cure of ours, whom we shall invoke in particular during the year for priests. May it also be the principal objective for each one of us in order to be ministers at the service of the gospel, study and a careful and continuing pastoral and theological formation is of course useful and necessary. But that knowledge of love which can only be learned in a heart to heart with Christ is even more necessary. With regard to a deeper knowledge and love of St. John Mary Vianney, I suggest as helps the classic biography of Abbé Francis Trochu, which was translated into English by Dom Ernest Graft, a Benedictine, and is available, or at least it has been available, through tan books. It was originally published in English by the Newman Press in Westminster, Maryland. Also, Father George Rutler, a priest of the Archdiocese of New York, has a a very fine book called The Curie of Ours Today, St. John Vianney, which was published by Ignatius Press in 1988 and I believe is still available. And there are other uh, books available as well. I would urge you, too, to uh, read again the letter of, of His Holiness Pope Benedict XVI proclaiming a year for priests on the 150th anniversary of the Dies, the Dies Natalis, the death of the Curie of Ars. And also, in that regard, I commend to you also the letter which Blessed John the Twenty Third wrote on the occasion of the hundredth, of the centennial of the death of the Curie of Ars. For us priests especially, and for all the faithful, the attention given to the heroic holiness of life of the Curie of Ars 
should lead us to a habit of reading the lives of priest saints and seeking their intercession. Pope Benedict XVI, for instance, referred to St. Paul. We think of countless other priest saints, each of whom uncovers for us some aspect of the infinite richness of the living presence of Christ, head and shepherd in his church. In our time, we think of Blessed Miguel Pro, for example, who has become very much uh, better known now in this time in which the, the, the persecution of the church in Mexico and the resistance of heroic Catholics and heroic priests like Blessed Miguel Pro have been made better known through the, the movie the, the, the Christiata. Think also of St. Maximilian Kolbe, how wonderfully he instructs us and assists us to be very close to the Mother of God in our priestly life and ministry. And I think, too, of a recently canonized Saint, St. Damon of Malachi. I recall in particular uh, from St. Damon, at one point he was asked how he managed to continue the, the seemingly impossible work uh, of his ministry alone as a priest with the lepers on the colony on the island of Malachi. And he responded uh, immediately saying that it was the Holy Eucharist, that it was his time spent, spent in prayer before the, the Holy Eucharist, which filled his heart with the love of Christ, which he was then able to communicate to the lepers. In recent times, if I must, may say by way of a uh, comment uh, there has been a, a, a defect in, in priestly formation which was, has entered in, in in the effort to uh, renew priestly formation uh, which uh, takes the focus off what uh, Blessed John Paul II taught us so clearly and I'll be making reference to it in the uh, post-synodal apostolic exhortation uh, pastoris dabo vobis, namely that the heart of the priestly spiritual life is pastoral charity. It is the union of the heart of the priest with the, the glorious pierced heart of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is pouring out incessantly and, and immeasurably the love of God the Father for all. Uh, today, and probably an influence of certain tendencies which there have been in spiritual life and so forth, uh, there is this preoccupation with ourselves and with our own emotional states and so forth, and all of these things have to be attended to. One has to uh, have a sound mind and a sound body, mens sana and corpore sano, but what has to be at the heart of our spiritual life is that pastoral charity of Christ, which is known first and foremost and most perfectly uh, in, in the Holy Eucharist. St. John, uh, I say in each of the lives of the pre saints, I mentioned that quotation from St. Damien of Malachi, but also. Uh, we see in the lives of all of the priest saints the truth which was declared by St. John Mary Vianney. And this we could have emblazoned in our minds, especially in difficult moments of the priestly ministry, especially when we're entering the confessional to hear confessions, or especially when we're anticipating maybe a difficult encounter, whether it be with an individual or with the uh, meetings which have become so much a part of our lives as priests. Uh, St. John Mary Vianney declared the priesthood is the love of the heart of Jesus. And if we can simply keep this in mind, keep trying to give our hearts uh, into the heart of Jesus, then we find this wisdom and strength to deal with the many and challenging situations of the priestly life and ministry in our time today practically, especially in our own nation, but in a lot of other places as well, uh, the, the priestly life and ministry has become ever more challenged by a world which 
has become ins insanely secularized and uh, is so corrosive of, of the lives of, of all of us, and certainly we shouldn't think that we as priests are, are exempt from that. And so we need to return often uh, to the heart of Jesus, especially as that heart has opened up for us in the Eucharistic sacrifice, that heart we contemplate as we pray before the Most Blessed Sacrament in the presence of the Most Blessed Sacrament. St. John <clears throat> Mary Vianney had a strong devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus through which he uh, formed his own priestly heart uh, centered upon the Eucharist and the regular confession of sins and the sacrament of penance. And this is at really the heart of the, of the devotion to the Sacred Heart of, of Jesus is this reparation which comes through the knowledge of our own sinfulness, the confession of our sins, and uh, the, that reparation inspired first and foremost by a deep love, a deep consciousness of the love of Christ for us and how abundantly that love has been poured out in our lives and our response of love, which begins with a reparation, with the, the confession of our sins, and then leads us into a true communion with our Lord in the Most Blessed Sacrament. He understood his call to be one in heart with the heart of Jesus, which is, is unceasingly thirsting for souls and pours out upon souls the all-merciful love of God the Father. Those final words of our Lord on the cross, I thirst, uh, should mark uh, the attitude with which we approach our priestly ministry, the thirst to bring as many souls as possible to the heart of Jesus, to the only source of their joy and happiness in this life and their, their eternal happiness in the life to come. The devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which is among the most esteemed and treasured devotions in the Church, is particularly apt for the living of the Eucharistic reality in each moment of each day, especially in the little church of our homes, and for readying, readying, readying oneself always for the most privileged encounter, indeed communion with Christ in the Eucharistic sacrifice, then for us as priests even more so, in that the, the heart of all, uh, the, our identity and the heart of all our priestly activity is in the daily offering of the Holy Mass, uh, how much this devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus can lead us ever into a deeper understanding of that identity and of the mission which follows from it. Uh, sometimes our own self-consciousness and even self-absorption leads us to be timid about manifesting the priestly character of our souls. And this can be a bit of a problem with certain spiritual movements that have entered even into seminaries which become uh, overly concerned uh, with turning inward on oneself and trying to discover uh, all the supposed secrets of our self-consciousness and so forth instead of leading the, the seminarian and priest to that uh, turning over his life with all of it. Every life is marked by not only by great joys but by sorrows, by uh, difficulties which we encounter. There is no heaven on earth. Uh, but the, if we can turn this over to our our Lord, and not become uh, absorbed with, with these matters, uh, then we become also much more uh, generous and courageous in manifesting our priestly character uh, in our, our encounters with others, manifesting it in a special way in that spiritual paternity for which we have been consecrated. This will be also central to what I have to say about the, the gift of celibacy, but the, the charism of celibacy is given uh, for, uh, the, for spiritual fatherhood. And, uh, a heart, uh, a man's being given completely to Christ can only be for one purpose, and that is to be a father. That's what we, that is our configuration as men. And uh, if the Lord calls us to forego the great good of the married life in order to embrace celibacy, it has to be for uh, that 
paternity, which is in our very nature, which expresses our very being as men, and that uh, is able to find ever greater expression to us in us to the degree that we can turn our lives more and more over to our Lord, not become absorbed with the difficulties of leading the celibate life, for instance, or, or some struggles that we've had from the past or in the present with leading the, the life of celibacy, but in, in trying to understand more deeply how this great gift, this great grace which Christ gives also to those whom he calls to the priesthood, uh, makes, it, uh, makes us true spiritual fathers. And people can have, and this, by the way, and I'll talk about this more later, but the reason why a priest even, uh, why the faithful and, and even other people are so attracted to priests is they understand immediately uh, by the priest's consecration and by his, his celibacy that he belongs complete to them. He doesn't have other uh, ties of his heart. Uh, to a wife or family, all those things are good in themselves, but for the priest, the, the only tie of his heart, the only bond he has is with all with whom he encounters, for whom he is consecrated and sent to bring the love of Christ. Um, I want to note here, too, uh, there's a danger, this, uh, I have lived through a very interesting period in the life of the church. I was entered the seminary in 1962 when uh, the life of the church seemed quite tranquil. By the time I, I, I finished my, my high school studies in 1966, things were already starting to come a bit unglued. A number of those uh, staples of the spiritual life and, and the priestly formation, now suddenly everything became questioned. We entered into that period of what uh, His Holiness Pope Benedict XVI is so aptly de described as the battle between two hermeneutics, the, the hermeneutic of reform and continuity, in other words, in which the, the practices and the discipline of, of the church uh, from the past is is appreciated and, and and brought to a greater adaptation to the time, and the hermeneutic of discontinuity, of rupture, which sees everything in the past as somehow a betrayal of of a kind of mythical uh, uh, church, which. Uh, was supposedly existed at the time of the first disciples and which now we presume to create ourselves without any reference to the past as if the life of the church was not organic by its very nature and so we ended up with a, a lot of, of upheaval. In 1968 I was sent to the Catholic University of America to, to study philosophy Thanks be to God, the School of Philosophy was a haven of very sound uh, priests and sound teaching, but the world around me, the seminary and so forth, had just become a, 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 a rudderless reality in which, sadly, uh, there was a, a great deal of harm done. But in any case, I, I say all this, certain things entered in, and one I just want to touch upon in terms of priestly identity, because it's really at the heart of it, is to, to say that there's a, a danger in our time of an excessive familiarity, which is practiced by priests. And this familiarity, which is inspired, I think, by a genuine desire to be close to the faithful, and that they would be able to draw upon the priestly gifts, in fact, actually hinders and even blocks the faithful from perceiving the transcendent gift of the priesthood. You know, telling someone to call you Joe or, or Frank or whatever may seem to be a way of drawing closer to the person, but in fact what it does is it, it blurs and obscures a fundamental uh, aspect of the relationship that the, the faithful have, your father. You know, why, should, 
why should we be timid about that? And uh, uh, I, I want to make that point very strongly, also in terms of the way of dress. Uh, you know, sometimes priests think it, thinks it, think it is helpful for them to, to dress in, in just secular attire. And, and in fact, it may help people to draw closer to the priest, but not in the right way. Uh, and no one can doubt that you're a, a human being with faults and failings. They want to be around you very long before they'll see that. But what they, what, what they need to see and what, what your title father and, and the way you dress and so forth in your own uh, propriety will convey to them is a greater reality, a transformation of that, that human reality, who you are, uh, for them, for for to be their spiritual father, and you know, I, I remember when I was teaching in high school from 1977 to 1980, uh, we used to have a vocation day, and heaven knows in those days we were struggling with all kinds of to try to rebuild all kinds of things. Uh, I'll, just to give you an example, I start, started in 1977, and I had to teach the course Introduction to Catholic Moral Teaching. And I had a, a students who had been in Catholic schools, for, probably at that time they were juniors, for 11 years at least, maybe 12. And they, they weren't people who had learning difficulties or anything else. They were normal. I remember one of the first classes I made reference to the Fifth Commandment. And this girl, the brightest girl, in fact, is one of the most, one of the brightest people I ever met, raised her hand and she said, uh, Father, what do you mean, the fifth commandment? Well, I was a little bit surprised. And I said, well, who can help Susan? Try and be a good teacher, call upon a group of about 30 young people there. Not one soul had a clue. But anyway, we were, uh, we were working with all of those kind of, of situations. Well, it becomes a vocation day so it all the sophomores in each class, I had, I had some sophomores and some juniors, into the theater for a vo- presentation by vocation director of the diocese and, uh, and by a religious sister. And I know there's well, at least one vocation director here, and I know this is not how it is today. But the, So the vocation director came in. He, he was dressed he had in a clergy shirt, uh, but he started out by pulling the tab out and sticking it in his pocket, and his whole talk was, I'm just like you. Then the sister came along, and, and she could have been on the cover of some fashion magazine. She really was a, a very, a very a beautiful woman, and she was dressed accordingly. With, and she had the same message. So one of the sophomore boys, I remember this this day, I remember his name, he raised his hand, and uh, he said, uh, if you're just like us, what good are you? <laughs> and I thought to myself, <laughs> right on. I mean, this is... Uh, it, uh, so afterwards, uh, the sister came to me, and she said, well, I hope, Father, that you're going to appropriately discipline that young man for that... Uh, disrespect, the disrespect he showed to me it wasn't disrespect, I think it was a very honest question, and she couldn't answer it, of course you can't answer it, uh, because it's not true that the priest or, or the religious sister is just like uh, uh, everyone else and so I say to for a priest to insist that he is like all of the faithful, not truly different from them is false humility and it leads the priest to act in ways which are harmful to his priestly identity. And rather than give way to a timidity of heart, we must let the courage of the heart of Jesus radiate from our hearts for the consolation and strength of the faithful, our care. And so being very courageous about our priestly identity doesn't mean that we're pompous or that uh, we look down on other people. All to the contrary, it, it, manifests, it manifests itself in a very deep uh, love and concern for people, but that is priestly, in, in which we recognize always that w- we have something to offer to people, which is, is by no merit of ours, but comes from Christ Himself at work in us by the grace of the sacrament of ho- holy orders. And so, I want to to make that point uh, very clearly. 
And Christ from, <coughs> Christ, from the very beginning of his public ministry, set certain disciples apart. He wasn't timid about that at all. Uh, for a particular formation of their hearts, which culminated in their ordination at the Last Supper. The distinct identity of of the priest, which in fact binds him to all the faithful by the bonds of selfless and oblative love, uh, a pure and selfless love, is found in the words, and these words identify us, do this in remembrance of me. In other words, we're called to act in the person of Christ Uh, most of all in the Holy Eucharist, but everything we do is related to what Christ does and desires to do for souls, that thirst of Christ for for all souls. And the apostles were formed throughout the public ministry of Christ for one sole purpose, to offer the Eucharistic sacrifice in the person of Christ, and that is to make ever new the sacrifice of Calvary, what he was going to accomplish on the following day in which he anticipated in the the Last Supper. Now it's their mission to make that that offering in, in its full reality always present on the altars of chapels and churches of all time and in every place. And that is the outpouring of divine love from the glorious pierced heart of Jesus. Everything else which the priest does finds its source and its ultimate meaning in the Eucharistic sacrifice to which he draws the flock in his care and at which he nourishes the flock with the incomparable food of the body and blood of Christ. And so the the great day of our relationship with anyone who we've been drawing closer uh, to Christ, uh, the small children, the day of their first Holy Communion, those who have been away from the faith when they return now, uh, to the faith and are receiving, able to receive Holy Communion or those whom we have helped and prepared to uh, either enter the full communion of the Holy Church or to seek baptism if they are unbaptized. Our Holy Father reminds us that the heart of Jesus is surrounded by the crown of thorns. So to the priestly heart will know the deep pain of suffering with Christ for the love of the flock. Oftentimes I'm led to meditate on how it must have seemed to our Lord. Uh, and, and we can never uh, also, we, can, we feel pain in our hearts, and it can sometimes seem more than we're able to bear. But think if you had the heart of God himself, and, and to witness the, the rejection which, which he experienced in, in his passion and death, even... I mean, the the foolishness of Peter, who denied that he ever knew him, and and thanks be to God, Peter had the humility to to repent and and to to turn back and then to become a a great hero uh, through his his crucifixion. But uh, to to think of what our Lord experienced, uh, well, we have those experiences too, and sometimes we we act as if we're surprised by them, and sometimes we are surprised by them, but we shouldn't be, because if we're configured to Christ, the shepherd and head of the flock, then we're going to share very much in that crown, crowning of thorns which he experienced. And this suffering comes from our own weakness and failure. Sometimes we, we ourselves realize that we have failed in some way in our ministry, but it also comes from the misunderstanding and even hostility which our priesthood sometimes sustains. And this, I, I know, <clears throat> from my communication with priests uh, in the United States, uh, it comes never more frequent because of the agenda of, of our government and uh, and very powerful secular agendas which are at work, uh, which are anti-life and anti-family, the priest who announces even in the most loving way the truth of the faith uh, will will find rejection and hostility. Uh, The priest was just telling me uh, on Monday before I left that he gave a homily in which he set forth the church's teaching on the um, the intrinsic evil of 
sexual acts between people of the same sex. And uh, a, a man who had been very prominent and generous in the parish got up and walked out and has never come back. And uh, then wrote the priest a letter saying that, you know, this the church has to update its teaching and that he's not going to tolerate this and so forth. And, and priests has tried to uh, engage him in some kind of instruction. But this is a very obviously a deeply painful uh, experience. And we have this, I mean, I, I had it too. Um, I remember one time I celebrated a confirmation. We had had in 2004 in the state of Missouri, uh, a referendum to define marriage as the union, the lifelong and, uh, union of one man and one woman. And thanks be to God, it passed by over 70% of the voters. But that fall, I did a confirmation, I, and I had written about it in the Archdiocesan paper, as it, surely I should have, trying to set forth the church's teaching and why it's important, this definition. And uh, after this confirmation, this I was at the reception following it. This lady came up to me, and she was very angry, and she said that she uh, that I had called her daughter evil. And I said to her, well, uh, Madam, I, I don't know to what you're referring, but I can assure you that I have never d declared anyone's daughter evil. And so she said, well, you wrote in the paper that that uh, acts between sexual acts between people of the same sex are are always wrong. And I said, well, that's true, that they're evil. She said, well, then she went on to tell me about her daughter and her partner and so forth. And I just said to her at the end of the conversation, I said, do you think, she said, we, we have to be loving. We have to be, we have to understand that there are other ways of, of loving than between a man and a woman and so forth. And, you know, we have to be, of course, tolerance, this, uh, which has become supposedly the key virtue, uh, and it certainly is not, um, but uh, we have to be tolerant of these things. And I just said, I said well, you may think that you're uh, doing the loving thing by tolerating this behavior. Uh, and she said, are they welcomed into her home, her daughter and her partner and all this? But I said, you're uh, actually uh, doing her a great harm. You need to try to help her to understand uh, and, Certainly you can't, that this is wrong, and certainly you can't be giving the idea that you think that this is fine. I, I'm quite confident that I did not convince her. But anyway, I just to, to say that uh, these kind of experiences are going to come, come to us, and we simply have to uh, reflect on that image of the heart of Jesus as it was described by St. Margaret Mary Alacoque as she uh, had the vision of the Sacred Heart and know that that is part of our priestly identity, that crown of thorns. The heart of Jesus is on fire with the thirst for the salvation of souls. The flames that are coming out of the heart of Jesus are, is that, uh, are the flames of divine love, uh, uh, which expresses itself on the cross and which accepts the wound of betrayal and rejection and the crown of thorns of suffering willingly embraced in faithful and enduring love. The sacred liturgy is the highest expression of our life in Christ. In its celebration, uh, the identity of the priest shines forth for all. And really, in the other encounters which we have with uh, the faithful, uh, there should be a certain sense in which their, their minds are, are led back to, uh, the, to their, uh, the sight of us celebrating the sacred liturgy, because that really is where our, our, our fullest identity is manifested. And therefore, I underline for you the importance of a devout celebration of the Holy Eucharist, uh, so that the truth that Christ is offering the Eucharistic sacrifice may be evident. Uh, this is another point I wanted to make very clear. It's not only spiritually sound for us to have a very strong emphasis on, on the truth that is Christ who's acting, and the more that that we can allow our personality to recede, so that the truth of, of Christ's action in us at, at the Holy Eucharist is is evident, the more faithfully uh, we will we will celebrate. Uh, following the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council, they developed the far, false notion that the worthy celebration of the sacred liturgy depended depended upon 
the personality of the individual priest, that the priest somehow made the sacred liturgy attractive and interesting. And I remember as a young priest uh, finding very discouraging a lot of faithful who would run around from one church to the other, depending on who the priest was and what antics he was going to introduce into the, the, the liturgy on any given Sunday or, or because of, of his idiosyncratic way of celebrating the, the, the sacred liturgy. Uh, and the truth is, and here we get to the false notion that I am the protagonist. And I mean by I, I don't mean myself as a priest, but that, that, that me as an, that I as an individual am the protagonist of the sacred liturgy. So I have, this is really, a, a, in the end, it's a kind of a blasphemous thought that, that I am going to make uh, the sacred liturgy, which is a gift from God, the action of Christ, interesting and attractive to people. Uh, you know, where did that come from? It, 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 it's, it, it's profoundly false. So, uh, uh, the truth is that the sacred liturgy, which and here this weighs on us particularly because in the words of St. Thomas Aquinas, which are also quoted in the council, it contains the total good of the church, and that's the truth. Uh, this is people experienced in the sacred liturgy, <clears throat> the total good of the church, Christ himself, and it is attractive in itself. And and if the sacred liturgy is celebrated reverently, people are attracted. How could they not be, unless they're, they're not right in the mind? Uh, and so uh, uh, our attempts to stamp the celebration of the sacred liturgy with our own personalities uh, does nothing else but obscure the ineffable reality of the real presence of Christ. And so our, the way we celebrate the sacred liturgy should draw people to see more fully and completely that it's Christ himself who's acting, who's descended from heaven and is making new his sacrifice on Calvary. So that the more that we are emptied of ourselves to let Christ act in us, especially in the Eucharistic sacrifice, the more truly we carry out our ministry and the more strongly the faithful are attracted to Christ. And uh, I just offer you the, uh, the reflection that what happened after the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council that was a derailing of the renewal of the sacred liturgy and certainly what the council taught, you won't find anything in the document Sacrosanctum Concilium, which is other, anything other, uh, other than edifying and, and faithful to the, the tradition, but then we, we got the so-called spirit of the council entered in and people uh, without any reference to Sacrosanctum Concilium, which has this famous phrase in number 22 about that no one is authorized to change even a, an iota of the sacred, not even the priest himself. We certainly, somewhere that got lost along the way, but, uh, but think, just consider how what happened, the coincidence, what happened with the renewal of the sacred liturgy and the loss of Eucharistic faith in our time, which is something for us as priests which should weigh very much on our minds. The, the number of, of, of faithful who, who no longer believe that the Eucharist is the true body and blood of Christ, and the many who, who regularly absent themselves from the, from the Sunday Eucharist and so forth, not at all realizing that it is the, 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 the source and summit of their, of their Christian life. So I want to make that point also uh, the whole question of uh, our priestly identity uh, is found most perfectly in the celebration of the of the holy eucharist and in that celebration that it is christ who who acts for us uh, that acts in us and through us and that so that our personality does uh, is has nothing to do with the efficaciousness of of the of the sacrament. When Saint John Mary Vianney, returning to our priestly model, arrived in ours, he found a parish which was dying. Uh, a people had grown cold in their love of Christ. It was kind of a hateful place, to be honest. 
And to address the situation, he did not try to devise some ingenious plan to win the attention of the faithful. What did he do? He drew them to the Holy Eucharist and the Sacrament of Penance, uniting his own fragile, doubting, and weak heart to the heart of Jesus in prayer before the Blessed Sacrament. And in those early days, he passed and, and throughout his priesthood hours and hours in prayer before the Blessed Sacrament. The faithful, who had been kind of hateful, uh, were slowly but surely discovering the mystery of God's love in their lives, the mystery of the selfless and unceasing love of God for them in Jesus Christ. During hours of prayer before the Blessed Sacrament, the people would go to find their parish priest there. St. John Mary Vianney was also available to the faithful to hear the confession of their sins and to impart sacramental absolution. The priest who correctly identifies himself in the culture in which we live can easily fall prey to discouragement. Think of St. John Mary Vianney. It's not all so different today. People today, as Blessed John Paul II pointed out, it isn't so much that they're hateful, but it's the indifference. It's just the complete indifference to, to the love of Christ in their lives. So we find ourselves in a similar situation. Uh, the world in which we exercise our priestly ministry has perhaps never been more secularized since the time of the first preaching of the gospel, the public ministry of Jesus. And resting in the heart of Jesus, the priest may wonder what he can effectively do to address the emptiness of contemporary culture and its lethal effects in the lives of the faithful and how, how much pain we, we suffer too because of our closeness to the faithful when we re witness the fruits of this secularized culture in the lives of the people. And there can really be a temptation to give up or to want to retire to a life of solitude and prayer, leaving the challenging task of the new evangelization as, as Pope Blessed John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI have called our, our work in this time to others or, or simply giving up on it. And really the situation of St. John Mary Vianney was not different. People who don't know his life very well are shocked to find out that he suffered this temptation to want to run away on more than one occasion. And it was serious. I mean, he was ready to go. And... Uh, he went to that parish at ours, which had been thoroughly infected by the godless ideology of the French Revolution. And what we're dealing with today in our secularized culture is not unrelated to the philosophical ideas which nurtured uh, the French Revolution. Uh, is what we uh, led him to want to, to, to go away and to just devote himself to prayer. Now, there are people who are called to that vocation, those who are called to the contemplative life, that was not his vocation. Uh, so he, Pope Benedict XVI, reminded us of the daily conversion of hearts which St. John Mary Vianney practiced and which kept him on, the, on task, kept him at, at work in, in this parish. He, the Pope wrote, Thanks to the word and the sacraments of Jesus, John Mary Vianney built up his flock, although he often trembled from a conviction of his personal inadequacy and desired more than once to withdraw from the responsibilities of the parish ministry out of a sense of his unworthiness. And how often do we not have the same sense, the great challenges of, of our time, and, and we, we think of our own weaknesses and you know, maybe lack of charisma or whatever it may be, and we say, well, how, how can I be the one who's to be the priest in this time? But anyway, the Pope continues, nonetheless, with exemplary obedience, he never abandoned his post, consumed as he was by apostolic zeal for the salvation of souls. That ultimately, I will have a special reflection on the virtue of obedience, but ultimately that's uh, what sustains us uh, in continuing in the mission. Uh, surely there are many temptations which are ours as priests, temptations which come from the weakness of our own flesh and temptations which come from the totally secularized culture in which we live and carry out our ministry. And we do not practice an asceticism of prayer and penance, which leads us to an ever greater obedience. We will abandon the flock. 
either by fleeing or by becoming lukewarm in our love of them. In other words, uh, just becoming functionaries, carrying out the, the functions of a priest, but not carrying them out from the, from the heart uh, of Jesus. Pope Benedict reminds us that souls have been won at the price of Jesus' own blood, and a priest cannot devote himself to their salvation if he refuses to share personally in the precious cost of redemption. And that's uh, a daunting thought, but one that we need to, uh, to have always in our minds. And probably most of us are not going to be called to shed our blood as our, our, our Lord did on the cross, but surely all of us are called to pour out our lives uh, in, in the priestly ministry, and that is costly, as you all well know. And we can't, the great temptation in our culture is really insidious in this regard, keeps tempting us to, to accommodate the ministry, to, uh, you know, the, the, the great temptation to think, oh, I, I gave up everything to do this, and how good and wonderful I am as a priest, therefore uh, I can indulge myself uh, in, in things that are not uh, of a priest or not uh, for our priestly ministry. It is the communion with the mystery of faith, the Eucharistic sacrifice and, the, and Eucharistic devotion uh, and the giving account of that communion through catechesis which identify the priest. And that's what basically St. John Mary Vinnie was about. Love of the Holy Eucharist and catechesis are inseparable, and that's my next point. And here, again, we've come through a time in which, I remember when I was a young priest, uh, there was an attempt to keep me from going into the classrooms in the school to, to teach the children about the faith, and, 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 the, and the catechetical program was completely out of the hands of the priests, one, as one of the catechists explained to me that, well, Father, you're not a professional uh, catechist. Well, that was the idea. I mean, you would think that's funny, but that, that was an idea at the time. And take a look at the figure of, of the priest in the parish today and how central is the work of catechesis uh, to the activities of the priest. And I think it's something we need to look at very seriously we, we've developed a whole kind of structure and so forth in the church where priests are, a priest has to be the administrator of the parish. He has to give the direction, and, and, and that means he has to have the, ultimately be in charge of the parish. But that can't come at the cost of, of, of not directly engaging in the teaching of the faith. Of course, we have always the Sunday homily, which we should consider a, a most sacred moment of our weekly activities, uh, and to make sure that it is an occasion of catechesis. Uh, I was shocked to the, uh, during the Synod on the Word of God to have a conversation with, with, a, with a major superior of a religious order who, who just railed against the idea that the homily was catechetical, and I can't imagine what else it would be. But the, you can see how some of these ideas have crept in and... Uh, According to him, the homily is simply to to uh, make people feel good about themselves, and their, and and surely, if you teach them the truth, they they will feel good. <laughs> In the end, it might be a little painful to hear, but but uh, this is something we have to come back to. And Saint John uh, Mary Vianney knew that the cold hearts of his parishioners could only be warmed by the knowledge of Christ and the gift of merciful love from his heart. And the people can only come to know that if they're catechized. They have to be catechized about sin, they have to be catechized about redemption, and catechized about how that redemptive work continues in the church, Christ alive for us in his church, uh, through the sacraments above all and through the many other beautiful aspects of our life in the church. So the cure of ours devoted a good part of his day to keeping company with our Lord in the tabernacle, his evident love of the Holy Eucharist gave form to what he taught and preached, and the two things went together. Blessed John the Twenty-Third, in his encyclical letter, Sacer Dotsi Nostri Primordia, that was written, I mentioned it earlier, 
on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the death of St. John Mary Vianney, strongly underlined the central place of teaching and preaching in the priestly life of the Curie of Ars, recalling the teaching of the Council of Trent on preaching and catechesis. And this is what the Council of Trent says. We need to think about this as a priest's first and greatest duty. One is particularly impressed with the tireless efforts of St. John Mary Vianney to preach and teach when one considers the difficulties which she experienced in studying and learning. I mean, if anyone had an excuse for avoiding teaching occasions, it was St. John Mary Vianney because he had trouble speaking and uh, but no, he, he dedicated himself to it, and, and, and so he became a great teacher. When I was growing up in my home parish, uh, my last years of grade school and first year of high school seminary, we had a pastor who had a terrible stutter. Uh, and I remember the struggle with which he gave the Sunday homily. But I have to tell you something. I remember a number of those homilies better than homilies that I heard from priests who were great orators and so forth. Uh, I guess in the end what we have to say is it's the love which drives the the preaching of the priest, which we understand even if he doesn't have. So we shouldn't be concerned uh, uh, that we're not the most eloquent. We can't all be the venerable Fulton J. Sheen and so forth. But if there's a great love in us, that, that, that inspires our, our preaching and teaching, that will communicate to people and, and, and they'll hold on to those truths because they are announced with love. I want here, and I realize that we're getting to the end of our time, I've taken a little longer than I thought, um, but we'll pick up on this in the next conference. Uh, I want to underline with you, having just mentioned the Venerable Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen, uh, it's also a point I want to emphasize strongly is the power of the daily holy hour uh, in our priestly life and ministry. This is a kind of intensified experience uh, of, of what St. John Mary Vianney was doing uh, uh, for a good part of every day in his parish to deal with this uh, extraordinary situation in which he found himself. And the fact is that the demands upon the priestly office are so great in our times, especially in view of the ever-increasing number of those coming to the faith, which is a wonderful thing. And, of course, so many people living in the culture in which we live are absolutely lost, and they're, they're going to come to the priest, God willing, to seek some help. Uh, and also, given the, the threats of indifferentism toward the faith or even persecution of the faith, that we can easily fall into the trap of thinking that we just can't stop in these activities. We have to keep, you know, we, we have to keep doing all of our priestly activities more and more. And, and what suffers is the time for prayer. We, it's kind of a, I remember when I was the newly ordained priest one time, I was invited to a rectory for a supper, and the, the priest was really a very outgoing, wonderful man, but he, he had his breviary was sitting there, uh, on by the this coffee table that I was sitting on the couch in the, next to it, and it seemed to have collected a fair amount of dust. And uh, somebody said something to him about it. They said, "John, that breviary looks like it's a little underused." And he re- repeated a phrase that uh, was used often, and it says, uh, "My prayer is my life." Uh, well. <laughs> It's, it's true that your, your life reflects your prayer if you pray, but it won't substitute, uh, your activity won't substitute for prayer. In other words, if you just keep acting, it's just going to be John who's acting. And, and while your natural goodness that night may be all bad, but what people expect from John is, 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 is Father. And that won't happen unless... Uh, unless you're spending time in prayer. And so we need to simply discipline ourselves um, to take time to be with our Lord in prayer and adoration. And that becomes difficult, I know, and people can be demanding, uh, but they have to understand that you need at least that hour every day 
uh, with our Lord, the presence of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, uh, uh, sometimes just simply to be qu quiet in his presence and let him, let him speak to your heart without you having to formulate all kinds of words and so forth. Uh, but then you can be certain that you'll be able to bring him. And that's really, people don't need me. I'm not the salvation of the world. People need Christ. And so I have to uh, be as close to him as possible so that I can bring him uh, to the people. And I've found, and I've had the temptation too, and I've not always been very good about this, but I've had that temptation too to, th to think that we'll just get to keep, keep working and don't, you don't have time right now for prayer or, or you know, the, the thing that poor too is, well, I'll get to that. So you get to it at, at the end of the day and you drag yourself into the chapel or into the church and what's left of you, I mean, our Lord is pleased with the letter we offer him, but there's, you'll be sound asleep probably in short order and, and granted that our Lord uh, can work on us while we're sleeping too and we hope that he does, but that isn't giving him the best uh, portion which we should do. Actually, I've found in my life now I just have to give him the first part of the day before the, everybody starts the, the coming for something or there are all kinds of scheduled activities. And, and, and then, God willing, there will be other times during the day too to, and, uh, to be with our Lord in, in prayer. But that holy hour, I want to stress that very much. As you may know, um, uh, Archbishop... Venerable Archbishop Sheen was a big proponent. He has some wonderful retreat talks, which thanks to these tapes and so forth are now uh, available uh, on the Holy Hour. Well, we, we've gone a little long. I didn't get to the, the part on priestly celibacy, but I will. Don't. Uh, and uh, we will continue our reflection then this afternoon. I might want to just mention to you, um, there is a wonderful document, the theme which Father Elias has very appropriately given to our time together, refers to uh, the, the priest as shepherd and particularly with regard to the discipline of the church of the code of canon law. And I, I will be making reference, even as I did in my homily this morning, to, the, uh, to that discipline. Uh, but uh, there's a wonderful book. It, it's a directory for the life and ministry of priests that was published by the, the Congregation for the Clergy. And... Uh, in um, 1994, and it, it really is a wonderful compendium making reference to, to uh, the various magisterial and canonical uh, texts. Uh, and I forgot to say this to Father Elias before that we perhaps could have some copies available, but this is a, a very handy reference and it's also very nicely indexed and it can be just a, a, a vade mecum for us as parish priests to. Uh, uh, use and keep ourselves, how should we say, uh, on the right track and properly focused. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit that it was in the beginning, is now, and it shall be world without end. Amen. St. John Mary Vianney, pray for uh, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good. Well, now we'll get back to our reflection. I want to finish this morning's reflection on the priestly identity uh, by talking a little bit about the evangelical councils and, and finally and most of all about priestly celibacy, and then uh, at least begin the, the, the second conference, which is uh, on the Holy Eucharist as a center and root of our uh, whole life as priests. But <clears throat> although we as diocesan priests, and I know you're not all diocesan priests, some of you are indeed are religious, uh, do not make the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, we recognize that the virtues of poverty, chastity, and obedience are the sure way 
to become more like Christ the High Priest in whom uh, we find our deepest identity. Pope Benedict XVI uh, helps us to understand more deeply uh, how to live the gospel virtues by reminding us of the manner in which St. John Mary Vianney lived them. And he wrote, The curé of ours lived the evangelical councils in a way suited to his priestly state. His poverty was not the poverty of a religious or a monk, but that proper to a priest. While managing much money, since well-to-do pilgrims naturally took an interest in his charitable works, he realized that everything had been donated to his church, his poor, his orphans, the girls of his providence, his families of modest means. Consequently, he was rich in giving to others and very poor for himself. His chastity, too, was, de- was that demanded of a priest for his ministry. It could be said that it was a chastity to- suited to one who must daily touch the Eucharist, who contemplates it blissfully and with that same bliss offers it to his faithful, to his flock. It was said of him that he radiated chastity. The faithful would see this when he turned and gazed at the tabernacle with loving eyes. Finally, St. John Mary Vianney's obedience found full embodiment in his conscientious fidelity to the daily, daily demands of his ministry. We know how he was tormented by the thought of his inadequacy for parish ministry and by the desire to flee in order to bewail his poor life in solitude. Only obedience and a thirst for souls convinced him to remain at his post. As he explained to himself and to his flock, there are no two good ways of serving God. There is only one. Serve him as he desires to be served. He considered that this golden rule for a life of obedience, he considered this the golden rule for a life of obedience, do only what can be offered to the good Lord. Our striving to practice the evangelical virtues of poverty, chastity, and obedience is the way to becoming more and more Christ-like and discovering the great beauty of the priesthood, bringing the deepest interior joy to our hearts and to the hearts of the faithful whom we serve. Viewing these virtues in the life of St. John Mary Vianney not only inspires zeal for the works of pastoral charity in the priest, but also helps him to discover the vices which weaken and even deaden the work of God's grace in him for the salvation of souls. Poverty teaches the detachment from material possessions and therefore from self, which renders a priestly heart ever more disposed to pure and selfless love of the flock. Through the grace of priestly celibacy, which I will in a minute dwell on in greater depth, The priest is enabled to become the spiritual father of countless children and to make present and visible in the world the life that all of the redeemed will experience in heaven after the resurrection of the dead on the last day. And finally, the obedience practiced by the saintly pastor of ours inspires the spiritual renewal of the priest as a humble and trusting co-worker of Christ and therefore of the bishops in communion with the Roman pontiff, the vicar of Christ on earth, in building up the church in unity and love. I'd like to dwell then just for a few minutes on the, in particular on the on priestly celibacy, which is in fact the, the form of the other priestly virtues in as much as it gives eloquent expression to the pastoral charity to the the Christ-like heart of the priest as a spiritual father uh, to uh, the whole flock without any uh, boundary or any condition. Uh, uh, I would like to use as the inspiration for uh, this little brief reflection on priestly celibacy to Uh, general audience addresses of Blessed Pope John Paul II, one on July 14th, 1993, and the other one on November 16th, 1994. Uh, In the one in the general audience on July 14th, 1993, 
the Holy Father takes leave for his reflection uh, from the encounter of Jesus with the first apostles and when he invited them to follow him uh, so that he might make them fishers of men. And the gospel tells us that they left everything and followed him. And one day, St. Peter remembered this aspect of the apostolic uh, uh, vocation and inquired to Jesus as he was often inquired, inspired to do in his spontaneity, uh, we've given up everything and followed you. Uh, and uh, uh, Jesus then listed all of the necessary detachments uh, of following him for, the sake, for his sake and for the sake of the gospel. And uh, this did not only mean renouncing material possessions, such as house or lands, but also being separated from loved ones brothers or sisters or mother or father or children, uh, uh, according to Matthew and Mark, and wife or brothers or parents or children, according to Luke. And the Holy Father points out, he said, here we note the difference in vocations. Jesus did not demand this radical renunciation of family life from all his disciples. And we, we know that there, are, there have been religious movements who, who in fact, did that. Uh, although he did require the first place in their hearts. The, our, our Lord demands the heart of every follower, to have the first place in the heart of every follower, but he demands something more of those who are called to the priesthood. Um, he said to everyone, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And in this way, he instructs us on the true nature of our love one for another in its various forms, whether it's the love of husband and wife or the love, uh, the love of parent and children or the, uh, or the love of friendship. And that is that all forms of love have to be pure and selfless. They have to be uh, an expression of Christ's own love. But the demand for this special uh, renunciation is proper to the apostolic life or the life of the special consecration of the priest. Uh, the, we know, for instance, that James and John, the sons of Zebedee, it tells us in the gospel that they left not only the boat on which they were mending their nets, but they also left their father who was with them. And this is typical of our life. Now, these observations uh, of the Holy Father help us to understand the reason for the church's uh, discipline on priestly celibacy. In fact, uh, the church has considered and still considers that it belongs to the logic of priestly consecration and the total belonging of Christ resulting from, and here I'm quoting the Holy Father, in order to fulfill consciously his mandate of evangelization and the, the spiritual life. And I want to underline this in particular because there's been some confusion about the church's commitment to the perfect continence of all clerics, which is legislated in the Code of Canon Law that says that all clerics are to observe a perfect continence. And in fact, that norm remains the, the teaching of the church and expression of her age-old discipline. What has happened in our time, especially through the institution of of, permanent, of the permanent diaconate with many permanent deacons being married uh, and also with the reception into the uh, full communion of the church and later the request of ordination on the part of, of members of some ecclesial communities, uh, Anglicans and, and Lutherans in particular uh, for ordination, those who are already married, of course, are permitted to remain married and some have deduced from this uh, a certain uh, direction in the church to uh, uh, a lessening of its appreciation and, uh, of celibacy as, using the word, uh, words of the Holy Father, as having belonging particularly to the logic of priestly consecration and of, and of the total belonging to Christ which results from it. But that is not, in fact, the case. And these are to be understood strictly as exceptions to what is, remains, the, the, the treasure of the church, namely the, the celibacy of her priests. I want to 
underline with you that very much. Underline that with you very much. Recently, there is a book published in Italian, which I hope will not be translated into English, which uh, by a very clever man, and as you know, uh, uh, those that uh, sow the seeds of confusion uh, and uh, error uh, are, can be very clever, in which he uses this kind of argument to insinuate that uh, the church now is uh, practically opening the way to the, to the abandonment of priestly celibacy. Um, and Jesus is, in fact, as the Pope, uh, Holy Father, Blessed John Paul II, points out, uh, uses a rather strong language about the renunciation which is required for the sake of the gospel, uh, that is a renunciation of marriage. And he refers to a passage, which he then he will elaborate more in the, in the uh, general audience talk of the following years. Some have, at this passage from Matthew chapter 19, some have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. And this was not, uh, people understood people who were eunuchs because of some physical deformity or some people who had been, who had been made eunuchs uh, by others in order to perform some particular service. But now he refers to a, a very particular uh, form of those who uh, renounce the good of marriage, namely for the sake of the kingdom, and that they do this in order to place themselves entirely at his service in the service of the gospel of the kingdom. See, Paul, in fact, states that he had resolved to take this same path and he shows the, uh, talks about the, the logic of his decision. He declares in the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 7, an unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how I may please the Lord. But a married man is anxious about the things of the world, how I may please his wife, and he is divided. It, it is certainly inappropriate, the Holy Father observes, for someone to be divided who, like the priest, has been called to be concerned totally about the things of the Lord. The division of, of affection in a husband or wife of, is something which is very natural and, and, and very coherent, also with a, a deep love of our Lord. But it, it be, this is, becomes problematic for the priest. And he then quotes the Presbyterium Ordinus, the number 16, uh, that the commitment of celibacy stemming from a tradition linked, linked to Christ is held by the church to be of great value in a special manner for the priestly life. It is at the same time a sign and a stimulus for pastoral charity and a special source of spiritual fecundity in the world. Tara, I'd like to underline with you in particular a point which I think we, we perhaps have not emphasized enough in the past, that the Lord himself gives the example for priestly celibacy and to the degree that we take our identity from him, which indeed we, we do as priests, but also to identify with him in this choice to remain celibate. And, uh, and so that, I think, for us should be a special source of inspiration and uh, also consolation to us in the, in the challenges which a celibate life uh, naturally involves us. Do, is every uh, form of, of pure and selfless love demands uh, of an individual. And then, uh, secondly, uh, would like to underline that the, yes, celibacy is a renunciation of the great good of marriage, but it's first a choice of love of Christ it's done for the sake of love of Christ and, and of, uh, of the gospel, of his gospel. And so it is f fundamentally an act of love. And out of that love then comes the free renunciation of the great good of marriage. Uh, when I was in the seminary, especially in the late 60s and into the early 70s, there was a tremendous debate over the, uh, the question of priestly celibacy with a lot of also mixed up understanding of the history of priestly celibacy, almost giving the impression that it, it was uh, not considered a great good for the priesthood until the ninth or even uh, later centuries, when in fact we, we're talking about the example of Christ himself and we're talking about uh, 
a way of life for priests that was seen from her earliest days uh, uh, to be the most appropriate and the most fitting. But in that period, the, the priestly celibacy was, was looked upon as something completely negative, something that you, you had to accept if you wanted to be a priest. And so oftentimes you would even hear priests in seminary and say, well, I, I, want, I want very much to be a priest. I hear the call to the priesthood, and therefore I accept this. But almost grudgingly, or almost as a kind of cross, put on the priest uh, uh, because of his response to the priestly vocation. We, we should not look at priestly celibacy in this way at all. We should see it as a most beautiful and additional gift of vocation of the priesthood, which helps us to express that vocation with a, with a particular totality, with a, with a uh, an undivided heart, a heart given totally to our Lord, and therefore is a great act of love. And I, I have striven, and, and, and I would, and no doubt you do too, but at the beginning of each day as I'm saying my, my prayers upon waking and so forth, to renew that act of love uh, which I made before the ordination of the diaconate to embrace perfect continence uh, for the sake of the kingdom and to see it as an act of love. Because if you see it negatively, it's just something that is imposed upon you because you're called to be a priest. Uh, your love for the flock will be considerably diminished and you will also uh, create for yourself, as no doubt you may have experienced in your own life, or in others, because we all can make mistakes in this regard, uh, great difficulties in le leading celibacy in a way that uh, brings us great joy and brings great joy to the flock that we serve. Those are, are two points in particular that I would like to underline. The example of our Lord himself, to whom we want in every way our lives to be conformed, and secondly, the primacy of celibacy as an act of love, uh, and from that act of love flows the free renunciation of the great good of marriage. And the Holy Father goes on to say that Jesus is the concrete ideal of this form of consecrated life, an example for everyone, but especially for priests. He lived as a celibate, and for this reason he could devote all his energy to preaching the kingdom of God and to serving people with a heart open to all humanity as the founder of a new spiritual family. His choice was truly for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. And by his example, he gives for us uh, a, a way uh, to be followed. And according to the Gospels, as uh, this is also an important point to, to underline, uh, it appears that the Twelve, destined to be the first to share in his priesthood, renounce family life in order to follow him. Uh, it's very interesting the Pope points this out. But the Gospels never speak of wives or children in regard to the Twelve. You hear about the, 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 the wife of Peter and so forth, but uh, they, they tell us that Peter was a married man before he was called by Jesus, but afterwards we don't hear of any involvement of, of, of wives or children with the apostles. And of course, we have some of these absurd claims now that Jesus himself was married, and one of the most effective arguments against that is uh, you, you would think that if, in fact, he was married, there would be some trace of mention of this uh, in the gospel accounts that his wife would have appeared at some point or whatever. I mean, these are all things that I'm really shame to even mention, but you hear these kind of claims from time to time. I uh, wanted then to, to just reflect a little bit more uh, uh, he concludes that audience talk then with the, the conclusion, these lofty, noble, spiritual reasons for uh, the gift of celibacy to those who are to be ordained. And he quotes here uh, from uh, Pastoris Dabovobis and the Presbyterium Ordinus, but he says uh, they can be summarized in the following essential point, a more complete adherence to Christ, loved and served with an undivided heart, 
greater availability to serve Christ's kingdom and to carry out their own tasks in the church, the most exclusive choice of spiritual fruitfulness, leading a life more like that, definitive uh, of one in the world, definitive uh, of the one in the world to come, and therefore more exemplary for life here below. This is a valid reason for all times, including our own, and is the supreme criterion of every judgment and every choice in harmony with Jesus' an invitation to the disciples, especially to the apostles, to leave everything. And uh, then I wanted just to conclude this reflection by taking up uh, the points that he makes in the November 16th, 1994 general audience and uh, uh, he speaks again about the, what he calls the precious gift of perfect continence out of a desire for the kingdom of heaven. This is the language also that's used in the Code of Canon Law with regard to priestly celibacy. And that in, in here, in a particular way, he draws out that it is outstanding among the evangelical councils. Uh, this is a gift of divine grace given by the Father to certain souls, whereby they may devote themselves to God alone the more easily due to an undivided heart. The reflection again, uh, reference again to the first letter to the Corinthians. Perfect continence for the love of God is an incentive to charity and is certainly a particular source of spiritual fecundity in the world. The fact of the matter is that when we live priestly celibacy with ever greater generosity, uh, poverty and obedience follow very naturally. There was an old professor uh, in canon law, and this, what he's called in the 1917 Code de Clericis, about the clergy, that he was given to repeating himself about certain points that he considered important. One of the uh, points that he repeated to us frequently is, where there are problems of chastity, there are problems of obedience. And I have to say, at the time I heard it, and I thought, well, that that makes good sense, but I have witnessed this repeatedly in my own uh, priesthood and priests who have found themselves in great difficulty, uh, a rebellion against certain church teaching, and then it comes out that, in fact, there was also, at the base of it, a failure to, to live priestly celibacy. And so I, uh, we, I have found, too, that the more that uh, the, the celibate life, I live the celibate life as, 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 as it is meant to be, the easier I find it to be generous with whatever material goods are at my disposal and also to be generous in, in obedience. No doubt you have the same experience yourself. But anyway, and then he goes on to talk about the three vows that are usually spoken of, poverty, chastity, and obedience, uh, beginning with the discussion of poverty as detachment from external goods, uh, external goods, excuse me, ranked on a lower level with regard to the goods of body and soul. And the council instead expressly mentions consecrated chastity before the other two vows, because normally we say poverty, chastity, and obedience, uh, because it considers chastity as the determining commitment of the state of consecrated life. It is also the evangelical counsel that most obviously shows the power of grace which raises love beyond the human being's natural inclinations. Then he goes into a a commentary on on the virtue, the gift of clerical celibacy in the gospel uh, using Jesus' own explanation of the importance that he places on the good uh, of the way of celibacy. According to Matthew, Jesus praised voluntary celibacy after he asserted the indissolubility of marriage. And this is a point I also want to underline very much. Since Jesus forbade husbands to divorce their wives, the the disciples reacted, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it it, it is not expedient to marry. Jesus answered by giving a deeper meaning to the phrase, it is not expedient to marry. Not all can receive this precept, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, who is able to receive this, let him receive it. 
It was by explicitly by stating the possibility of understanding a new way, which was that practiced by himself, by Jesus himself and the disciples, and which perhaps led those around him to wonder, even to criticize, Jesus used an image that alluded to a well-known fact, the condition of eunuchs. They could be such because of a congenital imperfection or because of human intervention. But Jesus immediately added that there was a new category, his, eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. It was obvious reference to the choice he made and commended to his closest followers. According to the Mosaic law, eunuchs were excluded from worship and the priesthood. An oracle in the book of Isaiah had foretold the end of this exclusion. And so Jesus opened an even more innovative horizon, the voluntary choice for the sake of the kingdom of heaven of this situation considered unworthy of man. Obviously, Jesus' words did not mean an actual physical mutilation, which the church has never permitted, but the free renunciation of sexual relations. And then the Holy Father quotes from Redemptionis Donum, an apostolic exhortation, that this means a renunciation, therefore, the reflection of the mystery of Calvary in order to be more fully in the crucified and risen Christ, renunciation in order to recognize fully in him the mystery of one's own human nature and to confirm this on the path of that wonderful process of which the same apostle writes in another place, though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed every day. This, I return again to this notion of making new every day, the the promise of celibacy which we made uh, the, before ordination to the, the diaconate. And here then, I want to draw one final point about clerical celibacy, and that is the bond it creates between the priest and those who are called to the married life. Uh, oftentimes, the, the idea has grown up that somehow clerical celibacy was a, a kind of point of, of, of criticism of the married life, and that the priest, almost by his way of life, uh, showed a certain condescension toward the married. And, and, and there's been a, a very strong resistance to the idea of, of celibacy as being a more perfect life. Uh, and the Holy Father comments on that in, in particular. Uh, yeah. Jesus was aware of the goods renounced by those who live in perpetual celibacy, and that we should always keep before our minds. We've given up a great good, the good of married life and, and the, the good of procreation. Uh, he himself had affirmed them shortly before when he spoke of marriage as the union of which God is the author and which therefore cannot be broken. Being committed to celibacy does not mean renouncing the goods inherent in the married life and the family, but never ceasing to appreciate them for their real goodness. The renunciation is made in view of a greater good, of higher goods, summed up in the beautiful gospel expression of the kingdom of heaven. This complete gift of self to this kingdom is the only thing that justifies and sanctifies celibacy. And so Jesus called attention to the gift of, of divine light needed to understand the way of celibacy freely embraced. Not everyone can understand it, as I'm sure you've also experienced in your lives, in the, sa- in the sense that not everyone is able to grasp its meaning. And oftentimes we find people who uh, uh, almost act as if the fact that we're, celibacy makes us poor souls in a way, you know, we had to to follow this way of life because we were called to the priesthood. And uh, I've also uh, heard of a, a practice which I consider almost blasphemous of, 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 of seminarians and priests being encouraged to, uh, to mourn <laughs> the children which they uh, would not uh, uh, procreate. Well, goodness gracious, uh, the, we're called in the celibate life uh, not to procreate physically, but to to be uh, fathers of a of a family which gets so large sometimes that we'd like to 
run away from the, the, the family and for a little peace and quiet. Uh, someone said, have said to me in the past, um, your life must be very lonely. And I, my response is usually, well, sometimes I wish it could be a little more lonely in the sense that, but that's a good thing. When people are like honey, uh, bees to honey, they, they see the priest and that he, he's totally for them and they, they, they come to him all the time. And so uh, this idea that, uh, that we should mourn the celibacy is, is, is really uh, very foreign and offensive to God. And uh, it, it's, a, it, it's really a privilege that's granted to certain souls, including ourselves, for the sake of a greater love, uh, for the sake of, of Christ's mission. And, and so, so we shouldn't be surprised, as the Holy Father says, if uh, there are those who do not understand the goodness of cons- consecrated celibacy, they're not attracted to it, or, and they're often not even able to appreciate it. Uh, but uh, as the Holy Father points out, this is simply a reflection of the fact that there are a variety of ways, charisms, and uh, services in the church, and uh, people need to be led through catechesis especially to uh, understand also the way of the, the virginal life of, of, of celibacy. Uh, now, with regard to the relationship to the, the, the married, and this is the final point then that I will, will make, is that uh, it's true, as St. As Paul points out, that the unmarried man is, should be, if, he, if his unmarried state has not led him to be self-centered and narcissistic, his unmarried state frees him to be concerned exclusively for the affairs of the Lord, how to please the Lord, whereas the married man uh, has to be also concerned about many worldly affairs, and most of all about uh, pleasing his wife and, and, and loving her with, with all his heart. So his interests are divided. This isn't a bad thing. It's simply a reality. Uh, now the apostle by that, St. Paul didn't mean to condemn the married life, uh, or to, as he says, to lay restraint on anyone. But with the realism of experience enlightened by the Holy Spirit, he speaks in councils, as he wrote, for your own benefit, to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. And that really is what clerical celibacy is, is all about. And it does, uh, uh, it does not cast a shadow on, on the goodness of the married state and here, the Holy Father quotes a passage from the Catechism for the Catholic Church, which I have found to be so true in my own life. Both the sacrament of matrimony and virginity for the sake of the kingdom of God come from the Lord himself. It is he who gives them meaning and grants them the grace which is indispensable for living them out in conformity with his will. Esteem of virginity for the sake of the kingdom and the Christian understanding of marriage are inseparable and they reinforce each other. That is a reference to number 1620 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. What I have found is that good married couples particularly treasure the friendship of a priest. And you can understand why, because they see in the the purity of his love uh, a a, a stimulus and an inspiration for them in their love for each other, which also has to be pure and selfless. And if it's if it's to be true love, in the same way too, I have found for my part uh, as a priest a great inspiration in, in some dear friends who are married and in, in contact with with families in general, because when I see the the sacrifice of husbands and wives to be faithful to each other and truly loving to one another and to their children, I'm led to to free myself of selfish concerns which I have and to free myself for a, a greater love of the church as I'm called uh, as a celibate, as a priest. And so the two uh, states in, in life really are very closely united to one another and one does not constitute uh, a, a, 
a relativization of the goodness of the other or a repudiation of the goodness of the other. And that's why I say that always in speaking about celibacy, yes, it's first and foremost an, an act of love of Christ and, and, and for the sake of his gospel, but at the same time a renunciation of what we see as the great good, the fundamental good of the, of the married life, which is God's chosen way. It's a, a natural sacrament of his own love, his chosen way of, of uh, giving new human life uh, through, uh, through the conjugal union, which is beautifully referred to as procreation because in the conjugal union there's always that openness uh, to, uh, to the gift of new human life which God alone gives. Just to conclude this first talk, uh, I want to underline finally the essential place of Mary Immaculate. In these days we're preparing with our novena for the, the great feast of the Immaculate Conception on Saturday, but to underline for you the essential place of Mary Immaculate in the life and devotion of St. John Mary Vianney, who's been our point of focus in this first reflection. Uh, already in 1836, and this is significantly before the, the definition of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception in 1854, the Curie of ours had dedicated his parish. The title he gave to his parish was Mary conceived without sin. This, as you know, the, the dogmatic definition is by its very nature as a dogma, the statement of something which the church has always and everywhere believed. So it, is, it wasn't like the Pope was creating some new reality, but uh, St. John Mary Vianney really reflected this uh, very strongly. Uh, in her Immaculate Conception, and when one reads his writings and prayers, he came to understand more deeply the great mystery of God's love of us, the mystery of faith, God the Son's taking of a human heart under the Immaculate Heart of Mary for the sake of our salvation. We see in a beautiful way in the Immaculate, in the immaculate Conception this uh, immeasurable and unceasing love of God who, who desires so much uh, our love that he comes himself and takes our human nature and therefore most fittingly prepares the womb to receive his coming by preserving the Virgin Mary from the very first moment of her life from any stain of sin which could not be present in the womb of the mother of God. Just as also it's not possible to conceive that the that the womb which bore God the Son into the world would have also borne other children. Um, we understand also then through the, the perpetual virginity of Mary. And the Bacuri of ours understood this so well. And we see how Mary, from the very first moment of her being, is totally for Christ, is totally for the redemptive work as an expression of this incomprehensible love of God which we, for us, which we call the great mystery of faith and most of all we, we experience directly in the Holy Eucharist. And thereby we understand also the high calling which is ours through the grace of baptism to belong totally in heart uh, to our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we, we see in, in, in the life of of St. John Mary Vianney, a particular uh, expression of the maternal care of Mary for priests. And, and this is such a great gift for us as priests. She was drawing him always to a, a deeper knowledge and love of the mystery of faith and especially of her divine son. Uh, one final little thing is uh, there's this wonderful book that Pope John Paul, the Blessed John Paul II wrote on the occasion of his 50th anniversary of priestly ordination. I'm sure that all of you 
to have it. I hope oh, the younger priests have seen it too. It's called Gift and Mystery. Uh, um, it came out on the occasion of his 50th anniversary. But in the back of it is, uh, in one of the appendixes, is a litany which I had not known before this book was published. It's called The Litany of Our Lord Jesus Christ, Priest and Victim. And I would encourage you very much to, uh, to pray that litany, especially during these days, uh, as a way of deepening your own love of the priestly vocation which you've been called and, and your own identity, uh, exclusive identity a, as a priest. Uh, here too, I will have occasion to mention it again. There's a wonderful book by uh, Archbishop Sheen uh, entitled uh, The Priest is Not His Own. You may have seen it. I believe it's been reprinted by Ignatius Press, but I might be wrong about that. But uh, that is also a wonderful book uh, to help us to uh, deepen our appreciation of that identity with Christ in the Paschal Mystery, which means the outpouring of our lives with him uh, for the sake of the flock. Well, I'd like then to at least, we have a little time yet, to begin then what was the second conference. The first one has become a conference and a half. So we'll, but we'll start the second one then on the Holy Eucharist. Uh, I want to, this follows very naturally uh, as the center and the root of the whole life of, of the priest. Uh, and my presentation, my reflection is inspired both by... Uh, a theological reflection upon the mystery of faith, the Eucharistic mystery, and its essential relationship to the ordained priesthood, but also it's inspired by my own personal experience as a, as a priest, the two things obviously uh, coherent with, with each other. And I can say this with all sincerity, to the degree that I have been a good and faithful priest the truth of what the church teaches concerning the relationship of the Holy Eucharist and the Holy Priesthood has been at the heart of my priestly life and ministry. That it is, it has kept me focused on my priestly identity and has been the source from which I've drawn the wisdom and strength to respond to my priestly vocation with an undivided heart. Um, uh, Blessed Pope John Paul II, in his book, Gift and Mystery, to which I just referred, written on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of his priestly ordination, <clears throat> commenting on the words of the priest, the mystery of faith, which we announce after the consecration of the precious blood, uh, after the consecration of the bread and wine, changing them into the body and blood of Christ. He wrote, Is this not the deepest reason behind the priestly vocation? Certainly it is already fully present at the time of ordination, but it needs to be interiorized and deepened for the rest of the priest's life. Only in this way can a priest discover in depth the great treasure which has been entrusted to him. Fifty years after my ordination, I can say that in the words, Mysterium Fide, we find evermore each day the meaning of our own priesthood. In the end, a priest is conscious that his entire priestly life is at the service of the mystery of faith, the mystery of the redemptive incarnation, which is experienced directly in the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. The first intimations of my vocation to the priesthood uh, came by way of wonder at the Eucharistic mystery. And this is very, how shall I say, very fresh in my mind. In the growing awareness of Christ's call to the priesthood of my life, which led to my entrance into the seminary, it was most of all participation in the Eucharistic sacrifice and in Eucharistic adoration, which continued to draw me to the priesthood and helped me to understand more and more the meaning of the priestly vocation. I can remember from my childhood uh, the, uh, the fascination, first of all, I could see the the supreme importance that my parents placed upon, uh, upon the Holy Mass. And I remember in particular one, I grew up in Wisconsin on a dairy farm. We were going in one Sunday uh, for Mass, and of course in Wisconsin it snows a lot in the wintertime, and so it so happened that the car slid off the road, and it took my father and some of the older, I was the youngest of six, some of the older 
children some time to get the car back on the road. And by the time we got to Mass, the, the priest was already at the offertory. And I remember I was very struck. My father said, well, we'll just have to wait now for the next Mass because we haven't arrived here. I mean, we could easily have been dispensed, but you see the, the importance that my parents placed upon, and, and this was not just them, but this was a kind of general uh, way of looking upon the, the Holy Mass. And then the, the whole action of the Mass uh, fascinated me very much, and I have to give my parents credit too. Sometimes I can understand this in a way. Parents have the tendency to try to keep their children distracted during Mass with cookies and, and toys and other games and so forth, whereas it might be uh, I think it would be more efficacious to try to draw their attention to what's happening at, at the Mass instead of, uh, instead of the other practice. And I remember having to be disciplined a few times uh, in, in Mass, but that was good for me. And then another practice, I was talking about one of the priests this morning about it, and we was talking about kind of informality which, is, which grew up uh, surrounding um, the Mass and other sacraments. But we had these Sunday Mass clothes. It was literally true that there were, you had clothes that you only wore to Sunday Mass, a special pair of shoes and, and so forth. That wasn't uncommon. And, but these are the sort of things that, that uh, capture a child's imagination and uh, they certainly captured mine. And there was then always, of course, a fascination with the, with the priest because you, it was clear that the wonderful action that was taking place could only take place if there was a priest. So all of that uh, uh, obviously led me to think about, uh, about the priesthood and then... The, uh, it was a great gift then to be able to serve Mass. And I remember then you were so close to the action of the priest. And of course, serving the priest directly, uh, there's just a natural identification uh, with the priest. And that only heightened uh, the attraction that I was having to the priesthood, which was principally associated uh, with, the, with the Holy Eucharist. Also, there was a strong Eucharistic devotions we used to uh, have after this, the High Mass on Sunday, always then some adoration with benediction of the Blessed Sacrament, but also then on, the, on uh, Friday evenings there was the Novena to the Sorrowful Mother, which was popular in our parish because the Redemptorist Fathers used to give the annual mission in the parish. And that was always concluded with, with, the, with the Eucharistic exposition and benediction and all of that uh, simply heightened the great love of the Eucharist and there uh, you cannot really have a true love of the Holy Eucharist which is not also a love of the priesthood it's just impossible for it to be otherwise and uh, and, and that certainly was was my experience and uh, I've never uh, lost a very uh, a special place in my heart for priests for that reason. And I had an experience as a youngster which uh, also was very uh, formative for me. When I was uh, eight years old, my uh, father became very ill. Uh, they didn't know at first what it was. This was in 1956, so medicine wasn't everything that it is today. Well, it turned out it was a brain tumor. <clears throat> and eventually... He came home, but he was dying, but thanks be to God, we could have him at home. But the priest would come to hear his confession and to bring him Holy Communion. And uh, uh, this was a very touching, very moving experience for me. In those days, when the, the priest arrived with the Blessed Sacrament, you met him at the door with candles. The whole family would we'd lead him in to my father's room. Then we went out. We heard my father's confession, and then uh, we would go in again when he uh, gave Holy Communion to my father. This was, I could see, uh, even as a child with the limited kind of perception that we have, I could see 
how this was in, in many respects uh, sustaining my father, how important it, it was to him. And of course, that left a, a very profound uh, impression upon me with regard to uh, the, the priestly identity and, and particularly, again, once again, associated with, uh, with the Holy Eucharist. Well, I grew up in that time that during the 50s and into the 60s where there was this strong Eucharistic devotion. Uh, and I'll talk about the, the, the devotion of the Sacred Heart of Jesus was fundamentally too. The enthronement was, the whole idea of it was to make a little altar in your home to unite your home, this little altar of your home with the altar of, of sacrifice uh, from which we are fed the body and blood of Christ. But I, having grown up, grown up in that time of strong Eucharistic devotion, my last years in the seminary, my first years of priestly life, coincided, coincided with a period of crisis in Eucharistic faith and, and an abandonment of Eucharistic devotion by many. Uh, I, I won't repeat what I heard in the seminary, the description of Eucharistic adoration and, and benediction. I can remember to this day, when, and this was a priest who said it to us, one of the priest faculty, uh, you know, referring to it as a form of pagan uh, activity. Uh, and, uh, and, and during this crisis, it was my earlier strong formation in Eucharistic faith and devotion at home and in the minor seminary which sustained me. Uh, and the suffering of the crisis, even more... Uh, taught me even more the essential importance of Eucharistic faith and devotion, both for the response to the vocation of the priesthood. And I saw so many when I entered the seminary, and even when I went on to, to, the, to the philosophy studies in Washington, the seminary was full, and the, the seminarians, as this crisis ensued and it got worse, the seminarians were leaving in droves. Uh, I think there were a lot of good men who left, but they... They left in a, in a state of, of real confusion. Um, I've often thought that the reason why during those years so many seminarians abandoned their studies for the priesthood and why so few then also commenced this other phenomenon that very few uh, young men were responding to the vocation to the priesthood, which prior to in my youth, there were many. I mean, I went to a, a, a rural in a rural community, the Catholic school, and three of us boys from the eighth grade went to the minor seminary, and that wasn't uncommon. They were all, in fact, they turned boys away. And I remember those days in the seminary, today we wouldn't be so, but men were let go rather easily. I remember one lad stole cookies out of another lad's locker, and he was in the car and on his way home. There was a very sort of strictness about this. But anyway, by the time I was ordained, or my last years of seminary studies, very few were responding to the vocation. And I, I have to say that I often thought that the reason was that this loss of Eucharistic faith and devotion without which the priestly vocation cannot be identified and indeed really makes no sense. If you, if you make out of the priest simply a social worker, uh, 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 and there's nothing wrong with social workers, but you don't have to be ordained a priest to be a social worker. Uh, no one's going to be attracted to it. Um, and I think the same thing happened with a, a lot of priests abandoning the priestly ministry because they, uh, the whole Eucharistic identity uh, uh, was, was lost. Uh, and I, on the other hand, I had four and a half blessed years as Archbishop of St. Louis, and one of the greatest blessings uh, was the, the seminary. It, it, it was my only, I was a bishop for, a diocesan bishop for 14 years, but in the first almost nine years, I didn't have a seminary in the diocese, my home diocese of the cross, but in St. Louis. But I could see, I would, tried to get out to the seminary at least once a week, for a visit, and then I would always go to the chapel, but the men were always, a good number of men were always in the chapel praying, and they, they wanted periods of Eucharistic adoration, and then to celebrate Mass for the seminary community, the preparation and the devotion with which the, the seminarians participate in the Holy Mass, you could see that this was really at the heart 
of, of, of the nurturing of their vocation and of their perseverance. Uh, this reflection on the objective reality of the relationship of the ordained priesthood to the Holy Eucharist, in fact, uh, leads to a deep conviction about the essential place of Eucharistic faith and devotion in the life of the seminary and her priest. And so I would like to uh, reflect on that, and I'm just going to do the one brief reflection, then I'll, I'll stop because I realize our time is running out. The first uh, has to do with the priesthood and the pastoral charity of our Lord Jesus Christ. The ordained priest, by the grace of the sacrament of holy orders, acts in the person of Christ, head and shepherd of the flock, in every time and place through his teaching. This is a marvelous expression of Christ's uh, love for the church, that he instituted this sacrament by which he himself, as head and shepherd, (coughs) reaches every time and place. And Pope John Paul II, blessed John Paul II, in his post-synodal apostolic exhortation, Pastoris Dabo Vobis, making reference to the decree Presbyterium Ordinus on the life ministry of priests, declared, by sacramental consecration, the priest is configured to Jesus Christ as head and shepherd of the church, and he is endowed with a spiritual power, which is a share in the authority with which Christ guides the church through his spirit. And he goes on to explain that, and that is from uh, number uh, 21 of the Pastoris Dabo Vobis. He goes on to explain that by the grace of priestly consecration, the, priest, the spiritual life of the priest is marked, molded, and characterized by the way of thinking and acting proper to Jesus Christ, head and shepherd of the church, and which are summed up in his pastoral charity. And this is really the the nucleus uh, of the the priestly spiritual life connected to the Eucharist. It is clear that the offering of the Holy Mass is the fullest expression of the pastoral charity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Calvary was was the uh, fullness of of the outpouring of Christ's life for us. Through the grace of ordination to the sacred priesthood, the priest is conformed to the person of Christ in his pastoral charity. The priest's soul is indelibly marked for the exercise of the pastoral charity of Christ on behalf of all men. It is therefore by the offering of the holy sacrifice of the Mass for the salvation of the world that the priest most fully and perfectly carries out the high priestly ministry of Christ to which he has been called and for which he has been configured to the person of Christ. Once we are ordained, our identity is Christ, shepherd and and head of the flock, and therefore, the center of every day of our lives has to be the offering of the Holy, Holy Mass. In Pastoris Dabo Vobis, Blessed John Paul II made specific reference to the highest expression of the priestly office, recalling the words of the ordaining bishop when he places the offerings for the Holy Mass in the hands of the newly ordained priest. Understand what you do, imitate what you celebrate, Conform your life to the mystery of the Lord's cross. Regarding what has been called the traditio instrumentorum, the handing over of the paten with the bread and the chalice with the wine, for the celebration of the Holy Mass and the accompanying words, Blessed Pope John Paul II declared, This is the invitation and admonition which the Church addresses to the priest in the rite of ordination when the offerings of the holy people for the Eucharistic sacrifice are placed in his hands. The mystery of which the priest is a steward is definitively Jesus Christ himself, who in the Spirit is the source of holiness and the call to sanctification. This mystery seeks expression in the priestly life. For this to be so, there is need for great vigilance and lively awareness. At every moment of the priest's life and ministry, he is returning to the Eucharistic sacrifice as the highest and most perfect expression of his priestly identity in order to understand his priestly mission of pastoral charity and to have the strength to carry out his divinely given mission. Regarding the spiritual life of the priest, Pope John Paul II declared, the internal principle 
the force which animates and guides the spiritual life of the priest, inasmuch as he is configured to Christ the head and shepherd, is pastoral charity as a participation in Jesus Christ's own pastoral charity, a gift freely bestowed by the Holy Spirit, and likewise a task and a call which demand a free and committed response on the part of the priest. Then I will continue with this uh, tomorrow on, on this whole notion, but th- just to introduce the, uh, the identity of the priest through the Holy Eucharist uh, and, and how this is particularly illumines for us the, the heart of our spirituality as priests, uh, namely the pastoral charity of our Lord Jesus Christ, head and shepherd of the flock. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, 